This is John Imrevar. In today's visit to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, we're going to concentrate on Gallery 362, a tiny room filled with Dutch paintings from the 1600s, the golden age of Dutch art. At this time, Dutch ships circled the globe, and the Netherlands emerged as an economic and military giant with a worldwide empire. This sparked an explosion of wealth. But newfound wealth also brought a sense of fragility. For example, in the 1600s, the Dutch invented the world's first stock market, where fortunes were made, and often lost, overnight. Much of the Dutch land is at or below sea level, and at any moment, floods or dike failures can and did kill thousands. Trading ships from around the world brought goods, but also plagues, one of which killed 10% of the Amsterdam population. And the Dutch were at war with other larger powers for half of the 1600s. We'll see signs of both wealth and insecurity in Dutch art. We also need to remember that another contributor to wealth was involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, which the Dutch only abolished in 1863. In the midst of all of this, a new wealthy Dutch merchant class emerged with a passionate love of art and money to buy it. They wanted pictures that celebrated their own lives, smaller pictures for their small houses. Let's listen to Dutch lute music and see some of their favorite paintings. They loved pictures of meals like this one by Haida, who painted over a hundred of these scenes. There's a lot going on here. First, notice the lemon, not native to Holland, but the Dutch were brilliant gardeners who could grow them indoors. And back here is mustard, made with exotic spices from Asia, reminding us of the vastness of the Dutch trading empire. Haida's brilliance was in making paint on a flat canvas take on three dimensions, like the folds in the tablecloth or the handling of the silver goblet. But the most impressive tour de force is the transparency of the glass, both where it's empty and where it has white wine. Look at these highlights reflecting the crossbars of a window we can't see. But I also see deeper meanings here. Notice that there's nothing still about this still life. The plates are precariously balanced at the edge of the table, about to fall off, suggesting that this elegant lifestyle can collapse at any moment. Dutch wealth and enjoyment is often mixed with an anxiety about impending disaster. They loved flowers and paintings of flowers like this one by van der Berg. But there is a deeper meaning here, that death is never far away. These flowers are in a stone niche, like a tomb, and some of the flowers are already dying, reminding us that things of this world never last. But we also see a caterpillar and a butterfly, reminding us that as the caterpillar becomes a butterfly, after death our soul will be free of the body in a glorious new existence. And look at these tulips with this striking color pattern. These are the famous broken bulb tulips, and the Dutch were obsessed with them. A futures market for the bulbs pushed rapidly rising prices, and in a few years the prices skyrocketed as people borrowed money to speculate on tulips. Eventually the bubble broke with disastrous consequences. Another cruel lesson about the instability of wealth. Outdoor scenes were in demand, like this winter landscape by Roysdale. It's really more of a skyscape, reminding us of the flatness of the Dutch countryside. Prior to this time, Dutch painters used landscape mostly as background in order to accentuate the human figures in the foreground, as we see here. And the backgrounds were fanciful rather than based on a real location. Roysdale sets this tradition on its head. He makes the human figures tiny in order to emphasize the vastness of the physical space. He also reminds us of the terrifying cold of what meteorologists called the Little Ice Age of the 1600s. Notice that people are even skating on the frozen canal, while others carry firewood to warm themselves. The windmills remind us of the fierce winds that blow in from the sea across a country that has no hills to stop the wind. All of this emphasizes the frailty of human life in a harsh environment. This artist, Sandra Dam, used tiny people to emphasize the vast size of magnificent Gothic cathedrals. 
Sandradam took precise measurements of this church to construct this one-point perspective view, like what you did in middle school art class. The horizon is very low to give us the feeling that we are in a building that towers above us. How plain the church is. A generation earlier, this was a Catholic cathedral with richly decorated walls. Radical Protestants have stripped the church of its decorations, leaving it starkly plain. Let's go back to those little people and some dogs. The tour guides at the museum love this painting. Why? Because instead of listening to a sermon, these people are having a guided tour. The museum's curators are able to identify these people. They are Frederick V of the Palatine and his wife, Elizabeth Stuart, daughter of an English king. They were crowned as the king and queen of Bohemia, but as Protestant rulers of a Catholic country, they were deposed after barely a year. Hence, they were known as the winter king and queen. So this picture would also remind viewers of the instability of life, where a Catholic church could become Protestant, and a Protestant king and queen could be deposed after only a year. Here's a scene of everyday life by Gerard Terbork the Younger. An anonymous soldier is writing a letter. Letter writing scenes were popular. Here's a similar one in the National Museum of Ireland by Vermeer. In each one, a person writes a letter, another waits to deliver it. There's great attention to details. We see in the Philadelphia painting an inkwell and sealing wax. The officer's plumed hat is on the table with a canopy bed in the background and a powder horn and a half-empty bottle on the mantelpiece. The messenger is a trumpeter. They were often used as couriers. These paintings often hint at a narrative. Here is the Ace of Hearts, suggesting that the officer is writing a love letter. But will the lovers be faithful to each other? The dog, often a symbol of faith, doesn't seem to be sure. Love can also be uncertain. Jan Steen is famous for his humor and satire. A quack doctor is trying to diagnose a young woman by taking her pulse. We, however, suggest that the reason her pulse is fast is that her lover is at the door, and she has just read a love letter. Meanwhile, this pot on the floor is a folk medicine method that supposedly detects pregnancy. Perhaps their relationship has progressed. Our eyes go to a man standing behind the doctor. That figure is Jan Steen himself. Here he is in his self-portrait. He often puts himself in his pictures. He's holding a very suggestive fish in one hand and two equally suggestive onions in the other, confirming our diagnosis. But the doctor has no idea what's going on. Stain's pictures are often like this one, crowded and chaotic. Even today in Holland, a messy home is described as a Jan Stain household. And the painting also suggests social chaos. Although the Dutch pride themselves on their strict Calvinism, lovers are promiscuous and doctors are charlatans. Our last picture is The Face of Christ by Rembrandt. He did many religious paintings and many portraits, and here he has done both. He's also done something radical. At this time, images of Jesus were usually copied from other paintings. Rembrandt broke with tradition and used a man from Amsterdam's Jewish quarter as his model. The result is a deeply humanistic portrayal of Jesus. I asked a college student once what Jesus is thinking here. He said, he is listening to us, emphasizing with our troubles and sorrow. We know that Rembrandt kept this painting in his own home in his last years. This was a troubled time for the artist. After earlier great success, he is now bankrupt, mourning the death of his lover and his son. Perhaps this was a vision of Jesus that could bring him comfort at a time when he was experiencing his own sense of sorrow and vulnerability. I love this little room. And the museum has many other fabulous Dutch paintings as well. I hope you'll come to the museum and see them for yourself. And thank you for joining me. Please see the description below for more information about the art and for links to my other videos on the great art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. <music>